117 days. And 117 days. Made it. Uh-huh. We have um, special guest today. Yeah, we got Matthew. <laughs> welcome. And yeah, welcome of to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Yes, um, Observation thank you. Podcast. Yes, um, that's, that's pretty cool. I want to start so it's off, not often. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> not often we have podcast hosts like come into our podcast. Usually it's like other people that come. We had one once and that was like a while ago so it's always good to have someone who's also in the game to you know just go through it with us and things like that so yeah it's pretty cool and i just guess yeah, like i, I want to say congrats i heard you uh you saw you got seventy five thousand plays this past month in june right wow uh well, yeah yeah i got like uh, a lot of people <laughs> for yeah uh, that was a that was yeah. a, a banner month um mm-hmm. for sure and uh yeah so the podcast is is you know kind of Mm-hmm. succeeded beyond my wildest dreams but um right but for you know again before before i get too much in that i just want to say thanks guys for having me on the show this is this, this is a treat amazing. it's especially a treat uh mm-hmm. being someone who usually interviews people it's it's a, <laughs> I'm, I'm, i've been on a couple of other podcasts and uh-huh. it's, it's definitely fun to kind of uh, sit on the other side of the table as it were so very much looking forward to the conversation awesome. yeah, that's cool that's that's pretty awesome to hear and yeah. uh speaking of so let's talk a little bit about your podcast since we yeah. have you here. That's so how did, yeah, like, why did, mm-hmm. how did it get started? Uh, so I discovered podcasts in like 2014, I would say, mm-hmm. um, kind of on a whim. I, 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 <laughs> I first got like an iPhone and, uh, and I, um, started hearing about this thing called a podcast and it was, this is like kind of before podcasts, you know, became a thing. And um, anyway, uh, so w- one of the things I do as my day job is I'm a, I'm a behavior analyst. I'm, I've been board certified since uh, the early 2000s. I've been practicing behavior analysis since 1999. So I've been at this game for a little bit. And I, uh, you know, a lot of people in my line of work drive a lot, and especially where I, I live in rural New England. And so a lot of times I'm driving to schools like that are an hour away, uh, easy. And that's not unusual for a lot of behavior analysts, uh, you know, who are either driving long distance to schools or a lot of behavior analysts provide services in home settings. So they're driving from one home to another and things like that. And the rural, uh, you know, kind of uh, communities that, that, that we serve, it's, it's uh, sometimes those homes are not in, you know, they're not conveniently located in the same neighborhood or things like that. So I started having all this drive time, I guess, uh, long story short, and I discovered podcasts, and I started listening to all sorts of stuff that, that were, you know, kind of aligned with my hobby. So I, you know, I'm a big New England Patriots fan, you know, for, for you know, uh, professional football, uh-huh. and you know, and so uh, I would listen. I listened to all these, you know, Pat's podcasts. I listened to stuff that was about other things related to things that were interest of mine in terms of like, you know, news and hobbies and politics and things along those lines. And uh, at a certain point I was like, gosh, th- this is really informational. And like, I, you know, uh, I, there's gotta be something in behavior analysis that I can listen to because I'm wasting all this time in the car. I could, you know, contribute to like my professional growth. And so I started looking, you know, in the, uh, you know, the Apple podcast kind of directories and, there were a couple of behavior analytic podcasts that had, that had uh, started up and then had uh, faded out, you know, which is not an uncommon occurrence in podcasting. I think it, there's actually a term for it. I don't know if you guys are familiar. It's called pod fading. Pod fading. Um, yeah, nope. yeah. It's not uh, in our dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, good, good. Don't don't learn that word. Yeah, keep, yeah. Um, but sometimes you see other people do it. They'll start a podcast and, uh, you know, and uh, get excited about it. And then, you know, the bloom comes off the rose a little bit. And, you know, next thing you know, they're not producing episodes. People get, you know, it's, it's as you guys know, it's a lot of work to do this sort of thing. And uh, so there were no long, you know, long story short, there were no actively published podcasts at the time. Uh, and around the same time, I started listening to other types of shows that were like, about podcasting which is like kind of meta right you know it's like podcasts about podcasts you know it's like a jerry seinfeld thing i guess Um, and uh you know and i started thinking you know maybe well you know maybe i should start a podcast and at the same time i've been thinking about kind of disseminating behavior analysis anyway because uh behavior analysis is growing like crazy and like there's 
Right now, there are like 40,000 board certified behavior analysts at one level or another worldwide. And more than half of those people have been uh, ha have achieved board certification status in only the last five years. Uh, so if you think on that for a second, you know, it, 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 the, if you graph the, 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 uh, the yearly, uh, you know, cumulative number of, of board certified behavior analysts, the, 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 the chart you, it kind of goes exponentially, uh, it, it would seem. And, um, you know, and so I, you know, being kind of an, a, a more seasoned practitioner, started thinking about, you know, maybe I should start a blog or a YouTube channel, you know, and maybe I should, you know, do something related to helping teachers in their classroom because my day job is basically I, I do be behavioral consultation in school settings well, that's uh, the goal and, of the podcast to like train teachers and well that's what it was oh, and then uh, i realized that uh that doing a blog very very you know to do a, a you know to do a blog at the quality that i wanted to or to do a youtube channel at the level of quality that i wanted to uh, do it at was an incredible amount of work, um, especially in that basically you have to kind of uh, almost, you know, write, write a paper essentially every time you want to do an episode uh, with all the research and things like that that goes into it. Because, you know, we're pretty big on, you know, not talking out your, your butt. You know, we want to make sure that the, the assertions that we make are, are, you know, tied to, you know, scientific evidence. And so uh, at the same time, I started listening to all these podcasts that were great kind of long form interview podcasts, things like, like the Tim Ferriss show and other sorts of shows like that, where it's just, you know, someone pick a very curious person picking the brain of an expert in a particular area. And I was like, you know what, that sounds like a, like a, would be a, a, it would be a better contribution and B from a production side of things. So long as I can, you know, get guests to, to do it. Um, you know, it would take some of the heavy lifting off of my shoulders and that I would just basically be asking <laughs> questions and we get this subject matter expert mm -hmm. to just riff on, on, off, off of that. Um, pretty much what we do too. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. You guys <laughs> know, right? Instead so, of just researching a certain topic, we just bring an expert in to tell us everything we want to know. And that's right. Just that's, add, so yeah, <laughs> totally. Totally. And you kind of get but, to make your own podcast episode based on what you want to learn about. Pretty Absolutely. Much. You know, what's funny is, uh, so I recorded like six or eight episodes before I even launched the podcast because I wanted to, um, I wanted to make sure I had uh, enough. I didn't want to be like, oh man, I got to, I got to, you know, find an interview guest, you know, because I have to put a podcast out this month. Um, so, you know, and one of the guys, one of the first, uh, out of the first half a dozen or so, I interviewed one guy twice. I brought him back and, uh, I was joking with him like this, I'm actually going to launch this show. This isn't just, you know, a uh, elaborate professional, a ruse for elaborate professional development on my part, you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's uh, yeah. So I launched the show in February of 2016. Amazing. So uh, pretty yeah. soon we'll be at fi the five year mark. Uh, I think I just published my 131st show. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, we've had over 2 million downloads. Catching uh, up real quick here. Yeah, uh, We're it, catching it, up real quick. <laughs> how many how many times do you, how many times do you put out an episode like per week or per month? Yeah, uh, I've been doing approximately three episodes a month. Mm -hmm. Three? Uh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, some sometimes mm -hmm. I'll do two. Sometimes I'll do four, and I don't. Okay. Uh, I I'm not super systematic like i don't it's not like the second and fourth tuesday of every month you know or whatever mm -hmm. you know or every wednesday at 8 p.m and the you know, new episode drop you know i've never you know kind of adhered to a schedule like that i've basically just said okay i mean don't get us wrong with, we're uh, every day whenever it drops basically <laughs> yeah <I> mean, that's, <laughs> every that's, day that's amazing whenever like, that's, it drops, so. that's crazy you guys are <laughs> Um, well, just for us, it was like, I mean, I can imagine like, I, I don't know, you can tell us you're old, you know, and we're <laughs> like, so if you're as an adult, a professional, right, and you want to reach out to another professional and you say, hey, I just want to sit down for an hour and talk about whatever functional analysis or any mm -hmm. like, particular subject. I, um, before podcast, is that what people did? They just hung out and they talked about these ideas? Because for us, it's like the reason we're doing it and we're doing it so much is that I feel like <laughs> we have access to all these different people and we get to talk to them and they want to come and talk to us. It's true. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really interesting question. So uh, when I first started the show, 
especially with some folks, I, I would I would say, hey, you know, I have this podcast, uh, and I would love to interview on, uh, in, have you on it to interview you. And by the way, a podcast <laughs> is like a radio show on the internet, you know. And so, uh, you know, so like, you know, if you wind the clock back five years or so, you know, podcasts weren't necessarily a household word. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't. And uh, so initially, I had to go out and seek people, but the vibe I wanted to get was basically uh, I wanted to have that conversation that is usually had at the bar at a behavior analytic conference. You know, like if you go to a behavior analytic conference, uh, especially some of the, the bigger flagship ones, um, yes, there are people doing presentations, there are people doing workshops, there's all sorts of, you know, really uh, awesome things to learn. But if you can get some of these people uh, and have an informal conversation where there's no direction or time limit to it, uh, it you know, you can, you can really dig deep on a particular uh, uh, topic. And so what I wanted to do is have that type of conversation, have the listener be kind of like a fly on the wall. So I want to have that kind of like uh, a coffee shop or, or, or pub, you know, kind of converse, you know, clo- you know, again, long form, no, no real structure to it. <laughs> uh to to just go you know pretty deep on a particular in a particular area so all that to say is that uh you know initially i had to reach out to a lot of people um and there are still people i reach out to uh who uh i'd I'd love to have on the show um and, and at the same time as podcasts have gotten more popular and as the show has become you know of notoriety in the field uh, or more visible in the field, a lot of people, I'm getting inbound requests to come on the show also. Um, so it's a little bit of a mix. So people realize that, hey, if I want to communicate very rapidly mm-hmm. to a large chunk of the field, um, this is one of the ways to do that. And so, I've, like I said, I get a lot of inbound requests to, to come on the show. Amazing. Um, I just imagine like, like um, two behavior analysts at a bar like smoking cigarettes and they're just talking about how to quit smoking addiction. <laughs> That's, is that what it's yeah. like? Yeah. How do you quit well, smoking? How, do you how, how does one quit? Uh, I how don't know. One, how does one quit smoking? I don't wow. Know. Well, um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I, I don't have personal experience with that cause I, mm-hmm. I, I've never been a smoker. So, uh, but, um, you know, there's some interesting research in the uh, what's referred to as the contingency management literature. Uh, and so I and before I kind of go on on this, I'm going off a of memory and it's probably mm-hmm. going to be imprecise. So if you're, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're an expert in this, you know, you're going to be yelling at your phone or, your, you know, your, your speaker or whatever here very shortly, as I almost certainly will get things, you know, uh, somewhat incorrect here. But um mm-hmm. You know, there was an interesting article in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis a year or two ago, uh, and they used an app called Stick, S-T-I-K-K, and the idea behind it is a um, a model where that whereby you uh, you somehow you know transfer funds to Stick, and uh, um, if I I can't remember the exact research design correctly, but the idea is that you set up like a, like an odd, like if you meet a certain criteria, you fail to meet a certain criteria, then stick will take a portion of the funds that you've transferred to them and donate it to a, uh, an organization that you oppose, (laughs) you know? So like if you're, you know, um, you know, if you're a Democrat, it would, you know, it it would donate to the, like to the RNC, uh, or vice versa, right? Um, you know, um, and, and you know, so the idea is that you really, really, really want to avoid that outcome. Uh-huh. Uh, and so I think the design was something like they, they, you know, basically you had to uh, test clean, otherwise you would, uh, you would have to, you know, basically, you know, donate, donate. to a, a non, wow. pref- you know, a non preferred entity. <laughs> um, and I, I think that. That was one method. Uh, there's a um, uh, there's a there's a, a more gentle like kind of contingency management literature that for addictions more generally it doesn't have to be cigarette smoke but they've used they've used these uh, interventions for uh, you know uh, for people who you know um, who abuse cocaine and heroin and things like that where basically uh, they have frequent check ins. You know, because you need to measure whether someone's clean or not, and if they're clean, then they 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 basically 
they're basically like on a token economy, meaning that they, um, uh, they would arrange a menu of reinforcers or rewards that the, uh, that the client would get based on meeting certain criteria. Um, so some of them are monetary rewards. Some of them were like, um, you know, uh, uh, like gift certificates, uh, things like that. Um, so it requires a bit of a, you know, an apparatus, if you will, to yeah. surround the, the patient or the, mm -hmm. whoever the client is seeking those services um, to, to deliver all those things and to, you know, obviously take the, the breath samples or the, the urine samples or whatever. Um, you know, so there's that. Um, but it, you know, that has been shown to be pretty effective. Um, there's also, uh, this is a bit outside of the realm of, you know, behavior, uh, analytic practices, but, uh, I had a guy on my podcast, um, a few months ago, uh, named Dr. Uh, Matt Johnson, and he is the, uh, the lead researcher at the Johns Hopkins school, med uh, medical school, their, um, uh, psychedelic research unit essentially um, and uh, they've, they've used uh, um, psilocybin mushrooms like this so the people would come in and, and, and basically trip essentially uh, the dude to have like a guided experience if you will and it's been helpful for uh, you know, to people to to quit smoking it's been helpful for the people mm -hmm. to uh, you know, come to terms with um, or be less distressed about like a terminal cancer diagnosis, things like that. So it's, um, uh, it's a, from what I understand, it's a pretty powerful intervention strategy. So that's, that's something else that, that's, um, that I'm aware of. Have you heard of uh, the hypnosis therapy where uh, they put you under this deep hypnotic state and they put like a, a suggestion of like a few sentences saying, for example, uh, whenever you think about cocaine, it brings up a very disgusting memory or a very terrifying memory. And as soon as they snap out of the hypnosis, anytime they feel like they want to take a, like, you know, they want to do a, a, what is the term for like whenever they want to use the drug. Use, use it? Yeah. Whenever, mm -hmm. yeah. So whenever they want to use the drug, uh, they instantly go and flash back to a really horrifying memory, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. like, I don't know if you've heard of this or not. I, I have not. The closest thing I've heard to uh, around something like that, I, I think there's a compound. Oh, gosh. Again, if so, there's an expert out there, they're going to cringe because <laughs> I'm not going to get this right. But I think it's called Antabuse. And it's, um, it's a, you, know, you, you take this, uh, this compound and then I think, I think it's with alcohol. Oh, alcohol. Yeah, right. And, so. and if you drink, it makes you violently ill. And the idea is that it creates a conditioned flavor aversion. So that every time you're around the, the presence of alcohol, you're like, oh, I want to stay. I got to get the hell away from that. So, um, you know, I, I think it's the same principle of aversive conditioning, you know, mm -hmm. classical conditioning. Um, so, but I, I'm I not mean, familiar I, with, the, with the, the hypnosis literature at all. I mean, I, I've seen it in uh, the movie. Uh, <laughs> You know which movie I'm talking about, right? <laughs> With uh, Jack Black? <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a uh, Get Out, I think. Ah, uh, Get right? Out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, I don't know. If that's... Did you watch that movie? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. If my, yeah, I didn't. Uh, I don't know if we're thinking of the same, the same movie. movie. Hold on. It was directed by um... Jordan Peele. That's Get Out. Yep. Mm -hmm. Him. All right. Yeah. Sure. And uh, there happened? was that scene where uh, the mother is literally. Uh -oh. Yes, you, yes, you yes. It, right? You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, is that, that's one of those movies I've seen in bits and pieces. I haven't, see, I haven't sat down and watched it from the beginning to the end. But I, yeah, All I remember right. there's hypnosis involved. And <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and down like down I researched you know? about it and like people are, were actually like, like the whole falling down stuff. That's just movie effects, right? Yeah, like, yeah, of course. <laughs> but here's my issue. Here's my, here's my issue with all of this. Uh, I don't believe in any of it. I'll hypnosis? say it like... Yeah, not just yeah. hypnosis, just the whole, you know, treatment and like this longer way of, I, I'm a more of a cold turkey kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Just if I well, want to stop. You can do cold, it. Yeah, if it. you can do it and you can, if you can do it, that's good. But yeah. a lot of people can't just. Be I mean, yeah, obviously. Like I'm not you. saying that's the mm -hmm. way to go. I'm just mm -hmm. saying like for me, like if I ever wanted to just stop any of my addiction, I'd just be like. What about video games? Huh? What about video? Can you quit cold turkey? Hmm? I think <laughs> I have, dude. Dude, yeah, like, like I, I, what's the most you spent on video games? Okay, <laughs> I've, been I've addicted once to video games? spent 14 <laughs> hours, but it was justified. It oh, was justified. I, 
I had I had a whole team. I couldn't let forty or thirty people down. <laughs> you then games for four, fourteen <laughs> hours straight. Yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> wow. How much How much do you need to game to be addicted to video games? But I don't do it every single day. That's the thing. That's true. Yeah, if it was like a single day, three or four times more habitually addicted. But like, yeah, yeah. how much would it take yeah, to get like, addicted to video games? Do you think? Are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I, you know, I mean, uh, you know, you have to put it in context, you know, like for some people that might, that, that number might vary depending on who you are. Like I have three kids and um, uh, I'm married and I have other interests that I, other things that I like to, I don't game. So let's put it that way. But if I were a gamer and if I were to kind of figure out what it meant, meant to be addicted to it, uh, I would probably say that, uh, you know, if it interfered with my ability to like do my job, to spend quality time with my family, to, you know, um, do other things that were of value to me, uh, then, then, and, and I, I couldn't change easily. Like, you know, I couldn't change those habits easily. How do you define that? Who knows? Um, you know, that, that might be one type of addiction and, you know, and that, and that doesn't, I know the classic hallmarks of addictions are like, you know, kind of uh, withdrawal and tolerance, you know, and so, um, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I'm sure gaming has its level, has its um, you know, amount of withdrawal. I don't know if tolerance comes into play. I, I you know, um, you know, I don't know if there's a, if there's a perfect analogy uh, for tolerance as it relates to the dosage of the video game, um, you know, so uh, how many video games install? until you feel it? How many how many hours of video games do you need to play before you start feeling the video game? <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. my test. I think I think my test for whether I'm addicted to video games or not is if I can go a whole like two or three days without playing, then I guess I'm not addicted. Like as simple as that. Because I have gone like weeks on end without playing. It happened before. Yeah. So and just I wasn't a, like just... uh, I need video games now. It's like oh, it's fine. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I mean, um, that sounds reasonable. The one thing I would just say to that is that it, it, you know, if you go three weeks without playing video games, and then you go on like a three-day bender, if you will, you know, um, that three day, three, you know, that three-day bender might be, might be a problem. You may not be addicted. I'm using air quotes for the, for people who are listening to this, and not watching. Uh, but, uh, you know, it may be problematic because it may create a barrier to accessing other valued activities in your life and interactions. That's, um, that's the only other way I would, I would, I would, I could construe that being problematic. But again, I'm, I'm kind of talking outside my area of expertise, but that doesn't stop um, you know me what it's called, about Ali? It, if you're talking, if you're playing video games straight for three days, I know it's like a thing. I, you know, I think it's more common than you think, Matt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a, a term for it. I, I don't know what it's called. But yeah, people like, go on it's vendors. It's like binge drinking. Yeah, but it's binge gaming. Yeah. No, huh. I mean, listen, the only like increase we'll ever see from uh, addiction to video games is now, especially during it's like everyone's quarantined mm -hmm. or were quarantined in mm -hmm. some countries, you know. Mm -hmm. And for months and months on end, they had nothing to do except, <laughs> I guess, video game. Mm -hmm. So yes, this might yes. have caused some sort of video game addiction, but mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I do it just to kill time, not yeah, because my, I actually find it fun. My middle child is a big gamer. We have a PlayStation, and uh, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to, you know, we have to, you know, set some limits, and you know, uh, yeah, left I to his own devices, he'd be on it quite, you know, quite, <laughs> quite a bit more than than he is already uh and, and, and we've actually lit, lightened up on our, our limits a little bit you know given those things you just mentioned and you know like not having a lot of other things to do given the quarantine circumstances um so, you know my my younger brother we used to always say in the family like this was back in like five six years ago we would say like with him you don't need to leave food or water you just leave like a video game and he'll be okay for the next few weeks it was like because it was like an addiction for him. And now he's just like not as bad as it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So, good to hear. That's, that's good for you, Jay. Anyways. Uh, uh, so you've seen the transition from quarantine to school? What's that like right now? Uh, yeah. Um, so here in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. uh, there's thankfully very little COVID-19. 
uh, and um, you know, um, you know, we have uh, there's in my state there's you know, there's like 1.36 million people. And right now, there's less than uh, 300 active cases of COVID-19. Wow. Okay, not so, bad. That's really good. Yeah, it's really good. And, yeah. And until, like, since the beginning until now, how many deaths have? Uh, uh, like, like under 450. I look at the numbers from, pretty frequently from, from COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 in New Hampshire yeah, yeah. specifically. Oh, wow. yeah, okay. New Hampshire specifically, yeah. Uh, and, you know, um, so... From like a worry of getting it, you know, we've, we've fortunately not, you know, it doesn't cause us much anxiety in terms of, you know, like I went to the grocery store earlier today, you know, and um, I, I, it's not something I worry about because the, 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 I think the prevalence is pretty low and everyone's wearing masks, yada, yada, yada. Everyone's being pretty careful. The school thing is tough. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, nothing's normal. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, so uh, despite the fact there's not a lot of COVID there, there's uh, we are getting some increase in positive tests as like the universities and schools have gone back. Uh, some of the school, there's one school in a different part of the state that is closed down this week because one staff member came down with it. Um, but uh, you know, wow. in mm -hmm. just speaking from the school district I live in um, you know, I have uh, uh, two middle school students and a high school student for as, as you know as children and my middle school my middle schoolers go to school five days a week it, the school day is slightly shortened they they kind of you know send them home instead of giving them like a flex or a study hall period uh, so they go to school from like seven thirty to one forty or something like that um, My high school student goes to school two days a week and is remote three days a week mm -hmm. and they break up the school into two groups. And so when, when, um, when she is home, the other half of the school is, is there. And there's also opportunities for kids to get their education 100% remotely as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my they, wife is a high school teacher. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. a kind of a complete pain in the ass, to be honest with you. But my wife's a high school teacher and she feels like it's, it's like for every class you have, T you you teach it's like teaching at three three different times and three different mod modalities to three different populations oh, wow. times the four or five classes you teach a day so it's um longer it's, working it's, hours yeah 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 it's a bit of a mess and it's and honestly it's it i, I can't see it being terribly sustainable yeah um, and but, like the, you know, the value like the education itself right is it i'm sure it's changed than before do you think <laughs> well, before also like before COVID entirely, there like I know there there are a lot of there are people that drop out of high school. There are people that drop out of school, and there's educations maybe um, I don't know, not the best version of what it was. And so after this transition with COVID, do you think it's only gotten worse, or you think it could get better? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely made it more challenging. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and you know you have to think of like you know teacher quality is probably you know like anything else you could put it on a you can map it out on a bell curve and and and, uh, and i think the teaching from a remote perspective or teaching remotely uh is going to make uh uh it's you know i it's going to affect higher performing teachers less and it's going to magnify the effect of lower performing teachers or less effective teachers, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, um, so uh, that that might be a wow. bit of a controversial statement. I don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, let others decide that. But you know, if if you're if you're a teacher who struggles to kind of connect with your class, and if you're a teacher that struggles to kind of command their attention, uh, and if you don't have lessons that are engaging, um, that doesn't bode well for for online instruction. You know, uh, whereas if the opposite is true, you have a chance, you have a, you have a chance to, you know, to, to do that. Like, you know, when, um, when school was 100% remote, uh, I remember last spring when my wife was teaching her class, she'd be like on a Google meet and she would get like a whiteboard. She's like literally holding a whiteboard and she'd be like, yep. And it's like this and like really, you know, engaging the students and uh and other teachers you know they would basically record their lesson and just play it and then they'd be like you know email me if you have questions you know mm -hmm. you know so i see two problems here 
in terms of teaching and uh, like in general. The first problem I see, especially in the United States and United Kingdom and the European countries is mainly that the teacher chases after the student in terms of, you know, all these different stuff, whereas like it should be the other way around. Mm -hmm. And I think mainly because kids nowadays lack the understanding of you guys you are know, too young to use that kids nowadays <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm 21 true, so no, i'm 21 so technically <laughs> like i'm not, not a really, kid anymore <laughs> yeah like we've, we've escaped that you know That's we funny. get we get our privileges in using that word <laughs> sir so, oh my god you guys are uh, silly <laughs> yeah no kids but i mean days. like if we look at the, like the newer generations right uh -huh. the newer generations here i won't set you with that word mm -hmm. the newer well generation. yeah it's a different generation Right, like, we're like, millennials, they're like young Gen Z, is the difference, pretty much. Yeah, it, so, so, like, what was I saying? I lost track. Oh, yeah, chasing it's kids after, these right. days, <laughs> kids these days. There we go. I'll use that word. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I feel like, and this is my opinion, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe your wife has told you otherwise, but like, but like, even back in your days, so I've heard. <laughs> okay, since I, I can't, you know, use that word. Right. But, uh, like, kids would run after their teachers, you know. Like, they would be chasing their teachers for the information. They were more responsible in their education than the teachers themselves. They were – it was, like, very strict and very tough because they had, they, they had the responsibility and they were held accountable for, you know, anything and everything. So – now it's like more of a, oh my God, did you do your homework? Did you do your homework? You know, mm -hmm. back yeah. then it was like, who didn't do their homework? Okay. And then like the ruler okay. would come out. So <laughs> what I would say to that uh, is that those kids who uh, existed back in my day, and I'm, mm. I'm 46 years old, so I, I can say that with some level of uh, authority. Um, I just think like uh, there's just more of them now. So the, 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 the Overton window has shifted a little bit so that uh, there's probably more representation of the kids who, who might not necessarily be, you know, super motivated or, and, or have uh, parents who place very high expectations on them, you know? Um, and uh, you know, one thing that I see is that uh, more generally societally is that, you know, um, when I was in school that if there was a, um, if there was a problem with my grades or, or any, you know, any discipline or anything like that in the school, it was from my parents' perspective, it was my problem. And what the teacher yep. said was gospel, you know, uh, and pretty much. Uh, and, and so a lot of times what you'll see is the opposite is that, you know, when, uh, you know, if there's an issue in school, um, you know, that the teacher's judgment gets questioned and, you know, the teacher's, the onus is on the teacher uh, and so on and so forth. So it's completely, it's completely reverse. So if a teacher tries to discipline a kid that the, the parent comes in and is upset with the school, whereas the, you know, the, you know, at least the way it was in my household, it would be the other way around where the, 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 my parents would be appalled at myself, yeah, at me, if I did something stupid. And uh, they would be, uh, you know, th their attitudes and, and, and feelings would be al aligned with the school. And it, would, it was my job to kind of get it fixed. It was, it was the same with me. But did you ever, did, did they use the, like, what, if your parents were upset with you, with you what, what would they have done? What was like the disciplinary act? Oh, of, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, uh yeah we we've uh uh yeah we, i understood we were... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> trust me i went through the same thing buddy it's, yeah. still, it's still going on here yeah yeah the old uh, yeah. belt shoe oh, yeah, we got, we got... That's close. uh yeah there was no belts involved or anything like that but what? yeah certainly dude certainly you missed was... out yeah oh yeah <laughs> um but uh, certainly no shortage of yelling and all that stuff and uh anything else in between but, so mm -hmm. i wanna I, there was there was another question drifted to a new subject i want to talk about kind of similar to this sure um i wanted to ask about like why do you think uh kids drop out of school um and um yeah <laughs> why do why, why do why kids do drop think, out of school? why do why do kids become unmotivated in in, in learning and yeah, yeah. education because like 
education can be the coolest thing, right? Because like me and Ali have a lot of fun. We're learning, right? And we're sharing yeah. with others. People want to watch. But when it comes to schooling, a lot of people drop. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I am, am uh, you know, it's not something this, I'm not, this is not something I've looked at the actual literature for. So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of like, I'm going to speculate using a behavioral lens, behavior analytic lens. And what I would say is, is that, you know, the, uh, probably a couple different issues. The first thing is that the, um, the reinforcers, the rewards of education oftentimes are delayed, you know? So what are those rewards? Okay, getting, maybe getting a better job or getting into a good college, which gets you into a better job. So there's all these little steps, you know? Uh, and, um, <laughs> So, so, you know, there, um, and, and so if it's difficult for someone to delay that gratification, uh, they might opt out of school at one of those uh, uh, junctures, if you will, one of those, those points along the way. Um, and so that could be one thing. Uh, and, and so sometimes, you know, so the idea that you have to do some like unpleasant stuff now for reward later, uh, you know, th there's different levels of tolerance for that, I, I think, just on a population basis, you know, and so uh, I, I would say there's that. And one thing that could, um, uh, so a couple of things that could, could play into that also is that, you know, if you have a kid who is um, accessing other reinforcers immediately, like partying and things like that, there, so the partying is available right now, right? It's a, it's a lower quality short-term reward that's available now versus what might be a, 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 higher, a higher quality reward, although it's probabilistic in nature, right? Because lots of people go to college and maybe, you know, mm -hmm. have, you know, don't, 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 don't achieve the life they want, I guess. I'm, just, I'm using the word <laughs> college, you know, more generally, mm -hmm. you know, so, so it's, um, so do you, do you take the really, you know, the low quality uh, immediately available reward of, of the thing that competes with school, you know, whether it's skipping school, doing drugs, yada, 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 uh, versus a, you know, uh, in, in completing non-preferred tasks, you know, enduring things that might be, le you know, le less, less fun than other activities for a probabilistic yet higher quality, larger magnitude reward years down the road. And that's, that's a really hard thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an issue. I it's mean, it's an issue. Like yeah. Leaving people yeah. behind. Right. Yeah. And, and what, what changed, what changed for me, like I was always a kind of a crappy student. Mm -hmm. I, look, <laughs> I wouldn't say crappy student. Uh -huh. I was a lazy student mm -hmm. uh, that um, I was always doing papers at the last minute. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I, was, I, I managed, <laughs> I, I was, I was able to kind of game the system to get okay grades. So my grades were okay. Um, I was never a straight A student, uh, but I was a I was a I was a B plus student, you know. And on a good day, I got an A minus, you know. But I was like, you know, B B plus, if you will. That was that was my wheel. That was my, you know. I was a was D plus jam. student. <laughs> yeah. Um, see see if I'm having a good time. <laughs> right, right. Um, but when I discovered behavior analysis, my junior year of college. Um, I, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I knew to be a behavior analyst, I need to go to graduate school, which meant I needed to get good grades. And so all those things kind of just snapped into place like a Lego set, you know, and I was just mm -hmm. like, Oh, I get it. I, and, and, and not, so the reinforcer was the material itself was fascinating. I loved what I was learning. And I also knew that I needed to, you know, get decent grades if I wanted to get into a good graduate program. Uh, and so f at that point, moving forward, school became very easy for, or, you know, I didn't mind doing the work. The work was inherently re reinforcing. So, you know, to, to, so this is kind of a long way around to like another answer to that potential answer to that question is if you don't find something you like to do, if you don't find things that are interesting to you, it's going to be a, a harder road. Um, but if you can find something that you, you like, and it doesn't have to be your calling in life. It doesn't have to be like, like my situation where it's like, oh, I, I've discovered behavior analysis and I, I realized that this is the thing I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be that, you know, uh, 
meaningful. It could be just something like, oh, I, I enjoy history. And maybe, maybe someone doesn't become a historian, but they're a history buff, you know, from, a, from that point forward in their lives. And they, you know, they just kind of nerd out on that stuff and really like it. So if you find something like you like to nerd out on, um, that's going to make staying in school a lot easier too, I would guess. Fair. Love that. All right. That's yeah. Uh, here's what I want to know. Uh, so people are going to hate me for saying this. And as if you've been watching a lot of our episodes, <laughs> you know, by now I really don't care. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it was too early to stop online classes. Why? Mm -hmm. Here's why. People gave online classes like a uh, really tough time and like really bad criticism in terms of like, oh, what if a student doesn't have good internet or, oh, what if the, it's 2020. There's no such thing as bad internet. There's decent and there's really good, right? Mm -hmm. So you said earlier on, and like, that's when you really like caught my attention was that it was better and more engaging when online classes were taking place. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That's uh, what you no, no. What I said is that on, teaching online on, um, basically allows struggling teach doesn't allow, uh, it, it amplifies the struggles that, that struggling teachers have. Meaning that if you have a, you know, if, like teachers who are high, high, uh, highly effective teachers are, are mm. going to, you know, they're, they're going to figure out a way to reach their students. Mm -hmm. um, struggling teachers are going, their struggles are going to be amplified. It's going to, it's like, puts like a magnifying glass on their, their, their um, skill deficits essentially. So uh, that's, that's the point I was trying to make. I apologize okay. if I wasn't clear with oh, that. I got it. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you made it because uh, I like, so you think it's going to amplify the struggles, but how, how, how would it, Will it amplify the struggle? Because, like, with, with you know, Google, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go. You know, People are used to watching was, like YouTube videos and like learning straight from them. So, pretty what's, much yeah, so. What's the difference if like recording like, a professor and like making it straight versus like an actual engaging teacher? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, for, for me, like, if I'm watching a YouTube video on how to play a certain, you know, uh, chord progression on the guitar from uh, if I want to you know learn how to fix my my dishwashing uh, you know my dishwasher <laughs> you know or something like that I'm motivated to find the answers and to learn that material um, you know uh, my 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 uh, my sons like to watch uh, you know YouTube videos on gaming you know so they can figure out how to do X, Y, and Z, or, or at least just watch people perform at a high level because it's reinforcing for, for them to do so. Um, but, but uh, uh, you know, they're not going to expend that amount of attention on diagramming sentences, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or, or uh, you know, <laughs> multiplying and dividing exponents, you know, so just, Fair. So, you know, the, the, the interest may not necessarily be there. And if you're, if you, mm -hmm. you know, and so, um, and if you're in an environment where there's lots of other distractions, like being at home, like you can, you have more freedom and things like that, you know, and, you know, and I would say like online class works, works, you know, probably works, you know, uh, for some kids, it's, it's probably great. And for others, they, they're going to struggle with it. And um, I would also say to the, to your point about there's no such thing as bad internet, I would, I would, gently push back on that and just say that uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um you know i i i, I, li I live in um you know rural new england and you know there are there are homes that have been that don't have internet uh for sure and as a matter really? of fact especially among oh, yeah, absolutely absolutely uh this, and um mm -hmm. wow. you know um yeah i mean we're we're we, we, there's large swaths of of new hampshire that don't have cell cover cell phone coverage too mm -hmm. um yeah, it's it, you know, and that's not that's not uncommon in certain areas of the United States. You know, I'm and talking. That's the first for me, to be honest. Like I've never heard of such. <laughs> not every city is New York or Los Angeles. There is. Yeah, it's not yeah. about that. Like if I'm talking about here in Kuwait, like all over, there's coverage and like internet and in the everything. <laughs> Even Dude, in yeah. the middle, yeah, literally. <laughs> Good, that's cool, but it's 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 not. We don't have that here. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, the the local school district in my mm -hmm. neck of the woods set up kind of like Wi-Fi stations 
and and you know uh so wow. like you could literally pull up to a certain parking lot and, and grab the wi-fi you know free wi-fi you know at, at, at certain spots work. around the uh around the the several towns that form up our school district uh, mm -hmm. uh because because some families didn't have uh, internet connection so it's a I real see. thing man mm -hmm. i i did not know so wow yeah. that's like <laughs> I'm still in shock of this, but because like, for example, my university, they complain that not everyone has good internet and all that stuff. So what did they do? They're like, fair. They set up a website and uh, it wasn't set. It was already set up. It's the e-learning website. So this website allows the professors and the lecturers to see like, oh, okay. So this person clicked on this link for the video, you know, and they would reinforce just to make sure like people are paying attention. They would give out like assignments, homeworks, or just like short quizzes after every lecture, just to see did the student completely understand what was being said in that lecture or did he not? It's not only beneficial for the student to reiterate the information they've learned on, you know, a quiz or an assignment, but it's also good for the lecturer or the teacher to know like, wow, okay, so I'm doing an okay job or ooh, I'm lacking in so-and-so and I might need to improve on that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I was trying to get to is that, you know, if the case was bad internet, then there is still a way to, like you said, uh, parking lot with free internet just for people who might not necessarily have it. They can download the video of the lecture that they missed, still watch it, still do the quiz and, you know, yeah, maybe I think motivated, motivated students are going to be motivated no matter what and not motivated people. It's going to be hard to, for them right now, hard to reach out to them, hard for them to learn. Right. And we yeah. also have to keep in mind that like so the, a lot of these online learners are very, very young children. So their kids doing online kindergarten, online first, second, <laughs> third grade, you know, where a lot yeah. of that learning is li quite literally hands on. Uh, and and um, those kids are, are, are definitely going to struggle uh, for sure. Kindergarten is online. Yeah, well, a lot of communities in the United States. Yeah, there's yes. absolutely. Yeah, I've got a friend yeah. of mine uh, that they live in New Jersey. They've got a, uh, they've got a daughter starting uh, starting kindergarten all mm -hmm. online. There's a lot of school districts that are just online right now in the states. Certainly, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we're we're fortunate here. We can do some in-person stuff here in New Hampshire just because of the the uh, low levels of the the COVID uh, coronavirus. But uh, I'm intrigued. Do yeah, they have uh, nap times online too, or like yeah, what, is it that they, what is it that they do online? I don't get it. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> they can I'm barely construct <laughs> sentences, let alone you know. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just so I'm so thankful my kids are older, and I'm so thankful oh, yeah. that my kids are better students than I was, and they're very they're very uh, diligent about doing their work independently. I'm glad. That's good to know. But yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. Do you like? Do you see us struggle in the transition back to normal society? Because I feel like we've been at this every single day for months now, staying inside, being scared of others, <laughs> sure, uh, all that. Uh, do you think there will be, or you a way back to normal? Yeah, you know, my opinion on the whole coronavirus stuff is a little, uh, a little radical, I suppose. <laughs> and, you know, I. Um, you know, I, I, I think that the, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard this saying, you know, virus gonna virus, uh, you know, and I think the virus is gonna virus, uh, regardless of what we do. And, you know, what we've done is we've basically made everyone, uh, we, 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 we've tried to, um, we've tried to prevent everyone from getting it but not everyone is at risk of either getting it or, or either getting it and becoming um, affected by it. You know, there's some number of people who, especially the younger, there's a relationship between youth and severity of, of, of uh, you know, affliction, if you will, or impact, I guess, is a better way to say it. You know, so for example, my, um, my mom is uh, 76 and uh, she's had open heart surgery and has other issues and things like that. Um, uh, if she gets COVID-19, 
um, there's a very high likelihood that um, she can get severely affected of it or, and possibly die, right? Um, you know, uh, my kids, not so much, you know, and I, I suppose I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, but still, like, I think the, 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 the curve kind of goes up, you know, quite steeply as you, as you get older. Um, you know, and so, like, I think some upwards of like 85% of the people who have died from COVID-19 uh, are in their 80s or older in the United States. Wow. To put it, you know, don't quote me on that. It could vary, you know. I could, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know but I, I yeah, think, think so. we're just talking, you know, it's, you know, it's a normal you know, so, conversation. So, it's not a. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I see. This is the behavior analyst in me, like wanting to make sure everything I say is is is, is you know, is backed up. You know, we have this aversion to talking out our ass. Um, but um, you know, so what I would like to see is that we expend all the energy that we're expending right now uh, in locking down society to shift that to shift those resources to protect uh, our elderly populations and those with pre-existing conditions uh, regardless of age you know and and um, if we can you know and, and then let the rest of society kind of function normally one of the things I, I've been worried about for a long, long time, ever since this pandemic and the lockdown broke, broke out, is that there's a, a the thing is that the, the COVID deaths are easily countable and therefore they're tangible and they're present in our psyche, if you will. What's, what's, what's less tangible, but it's no, uh, it's no less important is like the, the, uh, the, the um, social effects of this crisis. And I'm not just talking about social effects in terms of like not being able to see your friends, although that's part of it, but the social effects as it relates to, you know, increased um, uh, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, unemployment, bankruptcy, you know, because of the economic disruption, um, you know, uh, uh, because kids aren't in school, guess what's happening? Uh, uh, child family service, you know, uh, calls are going down. So if, if you have a, uh, you know, women or children who are living in situations where domestic violence is present, uh, there's going to be fewer people they interact with outside of that household who can uh, report those incidents, you know. Um, emergency room visits for domestic violence are up, you know. So there's a lot of bad shit that's going on. Um, that 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 is less tangible and less countable, but nonetheless very not a you know, very very important and potentially damaging relative to the to the COVID lockdown. So uh, I, I think um, you know we've seen these spikes kind of go up and down. You know, for example, right? You know, there was a spike over the summer in like you know the uh, southern states that seem to be on their way down. There's a spike right now now that college students have been back to to school. Although what's interesting is very few, if any of those college students who tested positive for COVID-19 have been hospitalized or, you know, have gotten severely ill. Um, you know, uh, right now, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, we have 1.36 million people in the state of New Hampshire. Currently, there are seven people hospitalized for COVID-19, maybe eight, from a high of like 125 in May. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have like I point zero. Zero 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 two percent of our population, wow. or something ridiculously mm -hmm. low mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying is that you know I I would I would agitate for a, a faster return to normal so long as we can put some safeguards in for those people who are truly truly at risk, not just for testing positive. You know, that's another thing too. It's like just because you test positive doesn't mean you're sick. You know, most people test positive who are totally unaware that they had it. Asymptomatic, yep. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and um, so for that reason, I you know I, I think that um, I think that's important, and also you know there are some things that come out of this pandemic. I think we should probably not go back on. You know, I think that's a you know like oh the ability to work from home when you can. You know, um, if you know there's this, you know that there are uh, there are major corporations who are selling their commercial properties because it's like. Well, why am I going to pay for this skyscraper in Boston? You know, this, 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 you know, the, the, the 32nd floor of the Prudential Center or something like that, when all my employees can work just as productively at home, mm -hmm. you know, um, 
you know, so things like that, that I think that, you know, that we've, we've, society has learned how to be more efficient with certain things, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh, so, um, you know, working at, you know, it's working from home is not for everyone and not all jobs can be done that way. Um, and, you know, I, I've got a buddy of mine who, you know, worked in an office that's 45 minutes away from uh, where he lives. And he likes going to the office like twice a week um, right now. And that's, that's probably where he's going to try to keep it, <laughs> you know, as, as, uh, as things kind of, as, as our, our uh, kind of lockdown relaxes a little bit, you know. So, I, I, I know for, a, for me, like an earful, I, but. In my opinion, I think that uh, we should like uh, like work is work and play is play, as like my dad would always tell me, even though I still get them mixed up. Regardless, <laughs> um, for people to work at home, I believe it, ca it causes a little bit of a stress internally of the lack of distinguishing of uh, mm -hmm. basically you know, like this is home, this is where I relax, this is where I eat, have a good time, maybe do a little bit of work just to catch up. And work is work, it's where I go. I'm, I put my 110% in, I fully focus, you know. Mm -hmm. Like if we ask everyone to just maintain working at home, I feel like it's, it's going to be a little bit of a struggle for most people who already fail to distinguish, you know, like. That's a, that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, and what I would say to that is that, you know, if, um, uh, what I would probably recommend is that if someone's working from home and if this is the new normal, uh, regardless, you know, lockdowns or not, that uh, to do two things. One would be to um, very clearly schedule when you are and aren't doing things rel related to the household and vice versa, you know, related to work, you know, so... Um, you know, some people can get away with like, oh, I'm going to put a, I'm going to put a load of laundry and then I'm going to go, you know, attend this Zoom meeting or something like that, you know, and then like, you know, that, that, that may work for some people. For some people, they might get sidetracked and start doing something else. Um, you know, so having clear, uh, uh, basically uh, scheduled boundaries, if you will, in terms of when you're on versus off, uh, you know, and then having low, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have enough space in your home setting, to say I I'm working right here, you know, and this is the space where I work. You know, it doesn't have to be your own office or study or something like that. But, you know, uh, you know, when the lockdown happened, we made little kind of cubbies for the kids, uh, and uh, uh, my wife put uh, put a desk in our, our. We have like a little tiny room with our washer and dryer in it. She put a desk in there, and uh, you know, uh, so that was her little workstation. And everyone really had everyone you know had their little spot. You know, um, and that seemed to work for us, you know, but I, you know, your point's well taken, you know, people can, you know, if you blur those lines, you're not, if you're not, you know, the whole thing is about being mindful about what you're doing and when and having it, you know, uh, you know, a clear uh, plan of, of how are you going to, you know, what, what you're going to do on a given day. I guess that would be my response to that. Interesting. Okay. Well, yeah. It's, that's pretty much what I've been doing all the time is like, I have a little office in my apartment mm -hmm. when I go to, cause I said in Jordan. So my apartment's in Jordan, I have a three bedroom apartment and I made one of them, you know, just purely my office where I do my work and everything. As soon as I go in that room, it's game time. As soon as I leave, like that's it. I'm good. You know, like it's, awesome. Uh, I just do whatever I want. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a really good tactic to set uh -huh. a place and pretty much like dog training. This is where I work when I'm in there. I work. So yeah, this is not bad. I think, yeah. And I, and I really like what you said. Um, I know we're, we're almost out of time here, but um, we want to talk oh, more about what you just sure. said about, I think it's really cool that to have just a plan at all, just like you can get through difficult times or just any times without um, like some kind of plan or some kind of uh, schedule. Can you tell us more about like how you plan things or how you schedule things or what you, the best well, ways? As one of my mentors said, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she used to say this all the time, take my advice because I'm not using it. Um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, you know, I just, uh, I try to, you know, what we do is we have a, f uh, a family calendar, digital calendar uh, that we all uh, put stuff in. 
so we all know who's doing what, when, and where. Um, you know, and so this is kind of like a blending of like a household and work strategy. So we do that. Uh, we have like a whiteboard calendar that's like basically eight and a half by 11 that we, that's on the side of our refrigerator. Uh, we haven't really been that great about filling it out as of late, but uh, when things get really hairy, scary, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll write out the week in terms of, you know, it's like, you know, um, and we'll write like, you know, what, what we're going to have for dinner on what nights and things like that, you know, so it's not like, you know, we all get home at, you know, whatever and be like, Oh crap, what are we making tonight? And that, you know, so try to make those decisions ahead of time. Um, you know, uh, so, um, yeah, so I think that just, I guess my, my, my general recommendation would be to just kind of, you know, try to book things in your calendar as much as you can. Um, I don't do this, but I've heard other people do this, you know, pretty effective and it's pretty effective too, is also to schedule your, your breaks in. Um, so, you know, uh, let's say, you know, you don't just put like, oh, I'm going to work from, you know, 830 to 12, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you can work in chunks and say, okay, you know, I'm going to work, you know, let, let's say you didn't have meetings in the morning, you know, if you have meetings, you can kind of use those as kind of anchor points. But if you didn't, you had other tasks to do, you say, okay, well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to write, uh, you know, proposals, or I'm going to, you know, what, you know, fill out TPS reports or whatever, you know, uh, from, you know, 8.30 to 9.30, then I'm going to, uh, you know, then I'm going to get, you know, make a cup of coffee and mindfully enjoy it, you know, for 10 minutes. And then, you know, from 9.40 until, you know, 10.30, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. You oh, know? God, yeah. So anyway. Yes. Anyways. Uh, uh, like I said, yeah. take my advice. I'm not using it. <laughs> there we go. I, there you I have it, that. folks. <laughs> Amazing. So before we end off everything, do you have anything you want to shout out? Anything you want to let the world know? Uh, yeah. Well, if you're interested in um, behavior analysis and behavior science more, more broadly, uh, you can tune into behavioral observations, the behavioral observations podcast. Uh, you can find out everything about the show over at behavioral observations.com. That's, you know, where you can find out uh, where the latest episodes are Link and uh, things below. like that. Yes. Yeah. So thank all you. That stuff. Yep. And, um, uh, and I'm on, um, you know, I'm on, uh, you know, Apple podcasts and Google and Spotify and basically anywhere you can get a podcast. Um, that's usually I, what I'd say. Anywhere you can get <laughs> a podcast, you listen, you'll find anywhere him. Anywhere <laughs> you can listen to a podcast, you'll find him as well as us. Uh, Just like, seen, subscribe, oh. leave a nice little rating or something. Sure. Why not? <laughs> why not? All right, yeah. guys. Anyways. Uh, this has been great I fun. Guess, I really appreciate it. It has been. Have, you've watched our full episodes before, haven't you? you I've watched it. Like I was saying, I was watched a couple of them. Oh, I, I didn't. So is, 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 <laughs> this, the, is this, this the, is the, the outro? Uh, All right. Peace. peace.